Good afternoon, evening, morning, wherever you are in the world joining us. My name is Michael. You know me as Jumpgate. I am here joined by Eric, our GM of games, and Carrie, our CEO. And we will be bringing you a wonderful AMA on lore and how it integrates into our game. Let's go ahead and get Eric and Carrie in here. Hey, guys. How's it going? How's it going? Can you hear me? Yeah, you sound great. You sound great, Jumpy. I gotta say, your your audio sounds really good. Your voice is very soothing and relaxing. <laughs> Thanks, Harry. Well, well I love to get the cool NPR podcast mics. We're starting to do enough of these, right? Right, right. Little pop yeah. filter, little boom mic. Yep. Get everybody geared up, right? Well, I think we can go ahead and jump right into it today. We've got a few people in the stream, so let's just go ahead and get started. So, Carrie, the first one's going to be for you, your Buffalo Commons book one. So, what is the writer's perspective on a bi-weekly chapter release, and what's your concept and methodology on the creation of this story? Oh, wow. Um, so, um, I, I was thinking about this story or some version of it. Uh, for a long time, actually, I've been working on it since my first son was born, um, and he's oh, he's about to turn seventeen. So, um, I started originally working on uh, originally Jesse's story, sort of a classic adventure story of him going off on a treasure hunt, and um, the Mars part of it uh, really grew over time. But publishing it biweekly, so I've had this concept for a long time. I've had the outline for a couple of years. And I just really needed to buckle down and do it in the context of everything else we're doing in our startup. And um, I thought it really, you know, I'd been thinking about trying serially. I was a little scared to do that, but it seemed to suit the format, you know, with the way that it's an adventure story and it's designed to be kind of a series of action stories with cliffhangers and so on. And um, and Eric, who's um, never shy about <laughs> about anything, um, kept, you know, sort of, he was very supportive, but he kept kind of gently mentioning that, uh, you know, if I, in case I didn't know it, uh, Andy Weir had started out with The Martian by publishing it serially on his website. And did I know that? And maybe we could think about just doing that. And uh, he thought that would be cool. So that's, that's what led to that. Yep. I was relentless about it. I, uh, I find new and creative ways to be redundant and reminder of that. Also, Lewis Chaw with The, uh, the Deer in the Cauldron. <laughs> The deer in the cauldron. Yes, yes. Yeah. I, I love that guy. After World War II in Hong Kong, he wrote, inspired by um, the Three Kingdoms, um, and then later on, Three Kingdoms was rewritten as uh, Outlaws of the Marsh in, like, I think the 12th, 13th century, and then Lewis Shaw came along with Deer in the Cauldron. But he would write 100 characters every single day in the morning. Then he would go and put together with wood, woodblock prints those 100 characters, and he would print his own sheets of his story and then he spent his afternoon selling the story and i think he didn't miss a single day i think it was for 30 years some dedication so, right there so what i'm thinking carrie is you could just release buffalo commons serially 
<laughs> just came for cadence. Yes, yeah. So somewhere between somewhere between traditional publishing and Lewis Chaw is what we're aiming for, because I don't think I can hit daily for 30 years. But, yeah. <laughs> well, fantastic. So since we have the book serially, Eric, what's your philosophy on the game design and the development in regards to integrating your written work, such as Carrie's novel, into a game like Million on Mars? Well, I'd love to get into that, but I want to honor the other part of your question was, what's, what's your methodology, yeah. right? Carrie is a mathematician, she's a mechanical engineer, she's an inventor, and she loves geeking out. And Carrie, I think you should share a little bit about your spreadsheets and all, all the, act there's a lot of engineering behind your story too. Like, <laughs> I, I, want, I want people to get paid off. It's not like something you just like, casually like, oh, okay, well maybe I'll just jot some words down. Like, give, give, give some hint behind the scenes of the scaffolding there. So, so I mentioned that I mentioned that I've had it outlined for a couple of years now, and it's designed to be. Um, so it's it's four it's four intersecting stories for four main characters that you've been introduced to so far. Um, there's Jesse and Marisol, whose story takes place in the early 2070s mainly, and then there's um, Velma and Beto, who uh, are these kind of larger than life characters who affect a lot of the action from the early 2030s up until Jesse and Marisol's time. And, um, and so I wanted to tell this kind of big epic scale story and the, you know, the four characters kind of come from four different places. They're inspired by um, different novels and different parts of the theme that I was trying to bring out. But um, yeah, I have this spreadsheet where I have all 24 chapters laid out, uh, the story arcs for each of the four characters. and where they're going in scenes and settings. And we've got um, artists who do a new, um, a new scene illustration for each new chapter before we publish them. So uh, they've been working on those since the beginning of the year. And it's all supposed to kind of map together into a big, epic, multi-generational story. Okay, and then, uh, so what do you think about writing serially, Carrie? Is it? <laughs> Thank you for this interview. Are you? Uh, <laughs> yeah. well, I'm excited about this question. The, the concept creation, the methodology. I think we can get some more. I think we can get some more out of this. And you know, you and I are so busy all the time. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and use this opportunity to get some questions off my my chest. Is it is it harder or easier than you thought to uh, to write on this uh, serialization cadence? Um. Uh. Gosh, both, you know, I mean, it, it's harder. Every part of it is harder, honestly. You know, it, it's, um, there's so much I wanted to say and it all seems so clear in my head for so long. And then when you actually try to get it out on the page, like with any big project, like anything that we do, it's, uh, um, you know, reality intrudes and then it's harder to say the things that you want to say in the order you want to say them and all that. So um, it's been a constant learning experience. I'm so grateful to have the chance to do this and to do it this way and to get uh, the serial part, I think, is ideal because I'm getting feedback along the way about what's working, what um, what's resonating for people, what doesn't make sense. Um, and I'm getting an opportunity to kind of weave that feedback in as I go. Um, but yeah, you. Uh, so the, okay, well, I can talk a little bit more about the, the four characters, the, the overall arc of the story and what I was trying to do here. I, this, this whole idea for me started out, um, because I wanted to write an adventure for my boys, as I've talked about. And I really wanted to explore the idea of a near-term future, a future that they might see that um, that looked like fun and that looked entertaining. And, you know, it was somewhat rooted in uh, plausibility based on a trajectory from where we are now. Uh, although it, it's not important to me that, you know, it's, it's 100% scientifically accurate. You know, I want it to feel fun and aspirational. Um, and so I wanted to bring in these ideas about um, how great life could be if we actually get to post scarcity. You know, if we have automation that's used to um, mine asteroids and harvest resources um, and what that kind of day-to-day -day life could look like. And then in starting to think about, you know, what would it take for us to get there? Um, there were ideas that I wanted to explore um, based on my own experiences in life, you know, where I came from a really... Um, 
patriotic um, American family that believed in the American dream. Um, and of course, that's something I've always wanted for my own sons. But I wanted to explore the idea that um, in this day and age, uh, the American dream might need to evolve. You know, our values might need to evolve a little bit to reflect the current reality of what we're trying to achieve. You know, the way that the way that there are so many of us um, on the planet now uh, versus, you know, when, when the idea of the American dream came about and it was about exploring um, an area with abundant resources where there was a lot of room for growth and a lot of room for more people is very different from um, attempting as a species to go and, you know, terraform a whole new planet we'll all, where we'll all be very dependent on each other just to survive day to day. And uh, maybe that means our values need to evolve and our goals need to evolve, but maybe we can get there if we figure that out pretty quickly. Agreed. That's fantastic. I, I got even more questions for you, Carrie. <laughs> As a writer, what, how do you do it mechanically? Are you, are you committing yourself to a writing session every day? Do you have a word count every day? Do you give yourself a day off? Like, how do you do it? <laughs> um, see, he's teasing me now because he knows this. He's always he's always uh, quizzing me about this. So, you know, I've tried. Uh, this is my first time trying to write a full length novel. I've always liked to write. I used to write short stories. I've done a lot of technical writing. I've done a lot of marketing writing, you know, uh, but this was my first time doing this. So there's been a lot of trial and error. Um, what I've settled on that works for me pretty well now is I... I write in pretty much three long sessions per week. I try to keep Thursdays as a completely no meeting day and try to keep it. Um, I found that to do the creative work, it isn't just the mechanical act of writing the words. You know, I kind of need to clear my mind of the the normal day to day stuff that I'm working on and thinking about, you know, marketing or sales or operations or or anything else. And and put my brain in the right space to be able to write. So it works better for me to do a big session on Thursdays and then usually um, one or two more on the weekends. And then I can just kind of f finish up a chapter um, inside of about a week. Oh. Awesome. All right. All right. I'm, I'm done hijacking you for a moment. Jumpgate. Just for a moment. Though. <laughs> just for a moment. We'll be back off to you. All what right. Do you think, Eric? So did you want to go cover the, uh, Restate your question now for me. Yeah, absolutely. So you, as the the GM of games here, what's your philosophy on the game design and development in regards to integrating uh, Carrie's book here? And, and how are you getting that into Million on Mars, the game? Yeah. Um, first, not being a general manager, not being a game designer, just thinking that from a player's point of view, I want to be honest. When I play games, especially games that are new to me, I first carry as a gameplay fun, and I try to play the game. And if I like the game, then I'm curious what the lore text is about and stuff, right? And so if I pass it, if I pass it by too quickly and I don't have a way to get back to it, um, I, feel, I feel sorry for myself. Um, I played World of Warcraft intensely for many, many years, and I did not read all their quest texts, and I did not follow all their videos. I was very much a PvP player, and an economy kind of player, and I just, well, PvP, really. And that's what I did. And then after a while, I'm kind of like, oh, gosh, I wish I read all those quests. Uh, I never got to it, you know? Um, you know, so Karen and I were talking about it. We settled on serialization. We settled on, well, let's make sure the player has some reward in the game. Um, Okay, great. Let's attach it into a, a profession specialization system. Working with Mitch. Okay, great. Let's have let's have chapters and let's have the chapters have a deposit bonus, a great deposit bonus, a one-time bonus, but then also have a recurring bonus. Like so, like I could see some players might just buy the chapters, might deposit them, grab the hundred fifty dollars, and go to town. But like, wait, come back, come back. You got to go go get those research papers. Maybe the players skipped it the first couple of times. Maybe they did. Maybe they just were just going for the game rewards. But you know, now you see the art, you see the art keep coming, you see that cadence, you see more references. Now we've got MetaShield out there, you start to see all these references. I, I don't feel entitled to any particular outcomes or any particular player behaviors. I feel like you have to 
work at it, uh, almost engineer it. Um, so very much lay the tracks, lay the connective tissue, like, please check it out, check it out. I personally thought chapter five was amazeballs. I was really, really happy about the, uh, you know, the existential uh, action. Uh, I won't give it away, but I really like chapter five a lot. So I think I think people get paid off. Like by the time you get there and you're getting invested and yeah, you know the characters are going on. Um, so I think we got that pattern done really well. And I, I feel um, really proud of our execution. I'm, I am not aware of any other Web3 game that's doing this, that is, that is publishing deep serialized lore and integrating it into the game and making people really touch it and feel it. I, there's an awful lot of breathless roadmaps out there, lots of roadmaps. A lot of roadmaps that have like really nice concept art that, that say that amazeball things are going to happen in the future. But I, as far as I know, we're leading the way in the actual execution and, and touching the narrative and, and using it. I don't feel satisfied yet, though. I think there's a lot more upside that we can have on, on bringing Carrie's story to life and making it more meaningful, truly in game, and then uh, and weaving it all the way through and having the players touch it right, all over the place. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. I think that, you know, you touched on the meta shield there. I think that's a really, really cool plot point. And, you know, something comes out of Carrie's novel, you know, the, the everybody knows about the meta shield, you know, at, you, protecting Mars from the radiation in our game. And and how and you can find out how that comes to be, you know, through her book novel. And, and now we have it in the game to play with. Players can craft those themselves and they can increase the space on their land through the MetaShield technology, which, you know, helps protect their Martisans or themselves and anybody that is working on their land from the, the, the radiation or the, the, the atmosphere that would be poisonous to um, the, the, the life on Mars that we're trying to create here. And I think that um, my next question would be, is how many people work on standing one of these chapters up to get this into the game? You know, Carrie's the writer here. I'm sure you're doing some work on this, Eric. But, you know, obviously you touched on that we have artists going to work on creating these chapter details. Um, we've got um, Mitch, our game designer, creating some of these different systems in game. But it, it seems like it's a company wide effort to get these things to life. It's a lot of work. Um, you know, either Carrie or I can talk about it, but it's a huge team effort. Like, I think I'll be provocative. I don't think one single human at the company truly knows every single step of the way for getting a chapter in the game from Carrie's, from Carrie's spreadsheet plot notes to Carrie writing, to delivering, to editing, to the art, to getting the art in there into the spreadsheet, getting the NFTs wired up, the schema, and plugging in. Like it, it, we have, we have got a checklist. A checklist wasn't good enough. We're working on a checklist some more. Kyle is working very closely with Carrie to try to get this checklist buttoned down. Like, we'll see. Chapter six might that that one might just sing, um, but it's actually terribly labor intensive. It's probably about four to eight hours of non-writing work. Um, just to bolt it in if you have the text and the art finished. Yeah, I want to I actually want to say something about that in general. You know, um, I I have loved I've been a reader my whole life. You know, I've been I've read novels my whole life. I've always been a bookworm. Um, I know Eric has been as well. Uh, but it's hard in modern life, you know, when your attentions are so divided and um, all the things, all the stuff that we all deal with, as we know, um, the interruptions of technology and very little separation between work life and home life and all that. And so I think I'm really geeking out because I feel like we're genuinely on to something. Um, in addition to we're onto something business model wise for how to roll out fiction in the modern world in a way that's, you know, bite-sized enough, um, but still gives you that satisfaction of a, a deep novel, a deep long novel, as opposed to a shallow short form kind of thing, which, which is great, but it's very different. Right. And I think that it's hard. Um, we really do want, you know, we want to inspire people and uh, that that tomorrow could be better than today. It doesn't have to be all gloom and doom. And to get to that idea, we've had to download a lot into RAM, you know, through the fiction. We've got this concept of a artificial magnetosphere that's been deployed, deployed in 2040. And something like Metis Shield. So my idea in coming up with that was 
both to have um, an example of a uh, technology that could make this happen faster on Mars, but it was also to try to help spur the, um, the economic feasibility. You know, I was trying to think about like, what would lead us, what would lead us as a species to actually um, invest in getting to a million people living on Mars to the point where it's self-sufficient. And um, part of it might be that it's possible and that the economics make sense. And so if Mars had, had some kind of export technology that was, uh, that was unique, you know, the, the, which MetaShield is in the time frame of the novel, you know, Bruhaha, Velma's company has the only known deposit of Metis um, in the galaxy and it's, and it's on Mars and they make MetaShield and they export it to Earth. Where, and so that means if you think about it, all these rockets going to Earth, suddenly the economics flip where it's very inexpensive um, to fly people up to Mars because there's, um, you know, a paying customer waiting for uh, rockets to, to be able to send this product back to Earth. So I tried to like think of all these factors that might come together to make it possible to get a lot of people up there cheaply over a short period of time and get to a place where the place was booming. And um, I, thought that, I thought that would be a world that would be fun to live in and to explore. Wonderful. Yeah. So another question I've got for you is the lore itself is this all coming from Carrie? Is it being developed in the game and being brought into the book? How is the balance between designing the game and writing the book creating the entirety of the lore of Million on Mars? Yeah, Eric, you want you should take this one. Yeah. You think I should? Yeah, yeah. All right. <laughs> okay. Um, Well, I'll start at the uh, sappy high level, and then I'll get into the, to the nitty gritty low level. Okay. At the sappy high level, it's like it's as Carrie talked about. She's been working on this book since for seventeen years. I've been working on this game for twenty five years in my head, right? Like that's how we met. We talked about. It. We were like, "Oh my god, you you care about this too? I care about this too? Great! We both want to make this wonderful, awesome future together." And we had, we had a brilliant time um, before we truly stood up the company and hired a bunch of folks. We had a brilliant time of like, I don't know, what was it? Nine months or so, Carrie, where we're basically hanging out at your wonderful house, which I've nicknamed the Sky Castle. It's a very nice house. It has a commanding view of the Austin skyline. It's, it's fantastic. Great, great pool, green belt. It's a great place to be in ID8. Um, kind of my, it's kind of my vacation place that I don't have to pay for. It's awesome. Uh, but I go hang out with her and we just talk about stuff and we're like, well, wouldn't it be cool about this? Wouldn't it be cool with, about this? Like, like for example, how we got to Meta Shield was we were talking about Valis Marineris and we we're talking about like, well, how long would it take to terraform all of Mars? Well, it'll take a long time. You have to really pump up the atmosphere to a very high density. You have to warm the place up. You have to exchange that carbon dioxide for oxygen. You have to remediate the soils and take the perchlorate out and give it back soils that humans and, and earth creatures can deal with. It's a lot of work, right? But rather than boil the ocean or make an ocean, you know, or and that sort of thing, why not just tent over a piece of Valles Marineris? And, you know, just a tent it, you know, and just have like a little a bubble, like work there. And so that's how that kind of worked out. Like, you know, Carrie and I sometimes riff together on the technologies and things like that. And we, we talk and... Uh, I'd like to think I'm a sounding board for some of the plot points, and I get to, I get to play a little bit. I get to, I get to hear a little bit about the story, and I don't have to do any of the hard work. I just get to chat and, <laughs> and just hang out at the Sky Castle. Um, so that's the high level stuff. But because I'm involved in that uh, process with her, I really know where she's thinking. I know the characters. I know kind of the plot line. So I have that in mind. Yeah. Uh, she also hears from me what, what I'm thinking about on a long-term game roadmap, and we, we we are truly riffing together. Like, okay, cool, cool, cool. How about this? 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 And, like, the little pieces, they start to fit together. They fit together better and better. And, you know, it just feels good when the, when the world design and the game design and all that stuff starts to fit together. And then, then you get that, like, magical thing where the ideas start. They start to, like, pop together. Like, honestly... Um, Let's talk. Let's talk about Metashield a little bit more. Right? Yeah. Um, we've had Metis. We've wanted to do Metashield in the game. You know, when we first released the library, we hinted about the Metashield. Um, you know, 
settlements are coming out. There's a lot of tension about putting the settlements together and moving things around. Um, but this might be too much behind. You know, this might be too much behind the scenes. Too much sausage making. So give me feedback if this is too much honesty. But it was really like on Friday afternoon last week. I was like, I should follow up on the Meta Shield thing again. Where are we on the negative space for a building? So I just I just grabbed a common water filter one on our test realm, and I gave it negative space, and I updated the test realm, and I played. I'm like, holy shit, negative space is working. It do, it wasn't working before, but at some point we fixed it. And I was like, okay, we can do a negative space. I got all excited, like, well, let's do it. And I was like, hey, Nicholas, go make a freaking meta shield. Hey, art, three D. You know, Max, go work up the game design. Boom, boom, get that together, and let and then let's review that with you know Mitch, see balance and everything like that, and then Carrie. I was like, Carrie, we're gonna do your meta shield. She's like, what? Okay, cool, cool. <laughs> you know? So we work really fast and quite a lot of chaos, but it is built into that long-term roadmap in the lore. So we don't. it's not that we don't care. It's not that we're not organized, but we really try to work creatively fast. We try to like really bring it to life as rapidly as possible. Um, you know, and then going low level, you know, I really like how distinct Carrie's characters are. Like Leon Dusk feels very different from Beto. Beto feels very different from Velma. You know, and I like talking to her about that. I I have written two books, but my two books are nonfiction. I don't know how you do characters. I, I find a lot of people very tedious, and so I'm not really good at making characters and doing that stuff. So I'm really, it's awesome for me. And she's got characters, that's neat. Um, so kind of looking forward to like, weaving that into factions, weaving that into some PvP, play, places like that. Uh, she pokes hard, really hard. She she truly gives a, a deep shit how we're using the characters in the lore in the game. If we misuse it or we, if we treat it casually, um, she gives me and the team rapid feedback to care more. Yeah. I, don't know if, I don't know if I covered that question well. I, I, think, I think you did a really good job on that. I, th I think you did. So I, I think that's a really good look into the philosophy on how Carrie comes up with her book, how Eric gets that book into the game, and how everybody kind of works on this to, to make sure that we've got a really well integrated IP of, of, of your book, Carrie, and, and have it push the story of Million on Mars and, and give us a lot, really a lot to work with. Um, we can get into some of these questions we've got from the audience because we have some of them that really, really work well with what we're talking about here. Um, Eric spoke just a minute ago about doing some uh, player versus player, but as we've talked before, if, if you know us, um, it's, it's going to be in light fashion. We're not going to go around Mars shooting each other, but we will have some kind of um, competitive leaderboard. We're standing up those leaderboards now. so. Is there any plans to possibly have some kind of player event where they will um, help kind of choose the story of Mars, what the players do matter, and, and, and can that push the story of what we're doing? That is that is such a great that's such a great idea. We've been talking about that. Um, we've been working on the reverse. You know, some um, some events that we've been building into lore that we want to build into gameplay um, more completely. Like we did one with um, the meta scavenging event, and you know that's tied to a a plot point that's going to come out in the book later. Um, you know, something that that happens when uh, Velma is trying to move large chunks of metas. Um, she gets up to stuff. She gets into trouble. So, you know, we've been working on that. Um, yeah, I know Eric is a big fan of Choose Your Own Adventure, and we're both, we've both been geeking out a lot. What I can say is we've been really enjoying, and I, again, feel so grateful uh, to have the opportunity to try to roll this story out, which is, a to me, a, a really fun experiment I've wanted to do for a long time. And to get to do it in this really novel way and explore, you know, what this looks like in Web3 and, and in a world where, you know, linear linear media seems to be fairly stagnant, both uh, both TV and movies and, um, and frankly, long form novels in a lot of ways. Um, and this is an opportunity to, to blow up that paradigm and still tell long form stories um, about really big, rich, complicated worlds. And so we have, um, 
we have we have narrative roadmap that ties to gameplay roadmap that goes out for almost a decade right now. Wow, that's yeah. that's pretty impressive, right? So, you have know, a plot line. You call it book one for a reason, right? There's another book after this, right? Yeah, yeah. There's there's at least three. So that, that yeah, very excited about that. And I am. It is a it is a group effort. Um, I'm enjoying doing it. I feel like, um, I, you know, I'm feeling like I'm getting a little bit better at it as time goes on, and uh, would love the opportunity to keep doing it. But I think we're so excited about this and so excited about the. Um, the reception to it and the way and we and we really believe we have conviction that um, we're on trend for people wanting um, wanting whole universes that they can explore through gaming especially ones that are more positive positive. Um, and I think I'm not going to be the only writer in this space you know we're talking about bringing in more more stories with more writers yeah definitely a collaborative effort there I think that leads into my next question which um, you, you answered there but Buffalo Commons is book one. How many books are in the series? Well, I think we just answered there could be up to three. Well, we have plans for up to three. We're going to see a lot more if we get some other writers in here, as you just teased, huh? Mm -hmm. So we also have 18 Martisans. So are those all going to be teased in or displayed in book one? Are we going to have to wait until book three to, to get to some of these characters? Or are players going to get to learn more about some of the, the characters that they've collected in their the yeah, so that's a great question. There, it's actually a little bit of. Um, there are none that are that we're going to have to wait for past book one, but there are a few that are part of the world that um, don't necessarily appear in book one, like uh, um, Sharon Jones, who's the COO at Duskworks, who's sort of our guide um, in our three D game, um, and we just thought she was the coolest character. I hope that we'll see her in book one. I'm not. I'm not a hundred percent sure though, um, but she was just really cool. So she showed up as one of the Martisans, um, and then Clara and Victor. Clara is a character who's in our um, our Marsbound series of short uh, short videos that are designed for in game. Um, we've been doing those as a little bit of an experiment too. And Clara was a character that was developed. Um, uh, Clara's got a, a couple of mothers and fathers actually. She was initially um, invented by Allie on our team. And then um, Cody Creative, who does the character art for us, um, has a writer who developed the Clara concept into a series of shorts. And she was designed to be a character who doesn't come directly from the novel, and that was sort of a practical thing, so it freed me up to write the novel at a different pace than the, than the game is coming out. Um, but she's also designed to come from, you know, she's, she's our woman on the street. You know, she's an everyday person. She's not Leon Dusk or some celebrity or some wealthy person on Mars. She's an everyday person who's, who's moving, who's immigrating to Mars, and we're hoping that she can be your guide through what life there is like. So she doesn't she's even we think we're, we're playing around with the timeline a little bit maybe eric wants to talk about that but we think she's sort of early 2060s on mars right now um and she doesn't necessarily cross paths with uh directly with the book characters but she's in the same world that's awesome yeah. thank you for everybody sharing. else is coming in book one oh. fantastic so this one's a little different, but it's asking, um, is the music part of the lore? Is there going to be Martisan's music? Is Are we going to be building out the soundtrack any further than we have so far with our the wonderful soundtrack that we've already got? Oh, yeah, yeah. OK, actually, I, I, I would like to leak something on this. Um, so a little bit of, uh, yeah, we're, we're really excited about music. Um, we're fortunate on our team to have a couple of really talented musicians. Um, we've got, of course, Allie, you know, who we've talked about before, who wrote um, actually our intro song that you heard uh, leading up here. And she's written some of the music that's used in, um, she's the sound of Clara, really. You know, Clara plays in a band and she's written a number of original pieces that we use in the game that are that come from the voice of Clara. Um, our soundtrack was initially done by, um, by Matt Gilmore. And as we move forward, we are looking at doing another soundtrack. Um, the, the leak is um, 
we have another member of our team, uh, Stan, who's recently joined us. He's a writer, but he's also a musician, a composer. Um, he's written some sci-fi themes as well. And so he and Allie are collaborating on some stuff. And they are looking at um, the new data that's coming out from the Perseverance rover that has shown us that sound actually travels at two speeds on Mars. So unlike Earth, sound travels a little more slowly than it does on Earth. But even more so, it travels at two different speeds depending on the pitch of the sound. So low pitch sounds are even slower than um, higher pitch sounds. So for instruments like guitars and pianos, they might sound really interesting in the Martian atmosphere. So, um, so we're working on, we're, we're doing some explorations now trying to figure out if we could, you know, lean into inventing some kind of Mars sound. Yeah, I'm really curious to figure out what that sounds like, but that's very... Very intriguing. Okay. Um, you, you spoke a little bit about Cody Creative and, and their role with Clara, but one of the uh, the players is asking, is that video series continuing? Um, the last one we got was of Clara and little Leon in space on their way to Mars, but we haven't heard anything about that uh, since the last episode. Yeah, so we are in we are in production on episode number four. Um, so, so far we've got four little videos in that series and then, um, we are we really love that we love those characters and we love that journey that they're on but we're trying we're taking a pause and we're figuring out how to weave them into the game and into the first time user experience um and then we'll get back to that so there are a couple more episodes coming out and then you'll see them get integrated into gameplay and then we'll be building on um that story i think in an interesting way um in time for the holidays cool thank you so much for answering that one I'm sure they'll be happy to hear that. So you've spoke a little bit to the book and we know that we have a couple of different factions in the book and we don't want to spoil who those are and what they're doing right now. But Eric, I've got a question for you. Are we contemplating introducing factions to Million on Mars? You, you spoke a little bit before you played World of Warcraft. You know Horde versus Alliance is a very strong, willful um, devising line between some of the players of that um, previous title there, and then how would Million on Mars monitor the fine line between supporting your uh, faction and going completely overboard um, if we were to go in that direction? So I have a lot of passion around this, and I gotta get two things off my chest first of all. Uh, you gotta go Horde. Alliance sucks. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. Right? And then Super, Super Geek, if you played a whole lot of Ingress, Resistance, those are the guys, you know? Frog, frog suck. Um, that's at you, ma'am. Um, but in general, um, I love faction versus faction play. Because, if, and then, you know, because, you know, also with a GM on Mafia Wars, it's so great to be part of a big, epic struggle, a big, big super family. And you have something, you have like a, a dynamic storyline, a plot line. That's one of the things I really love about massively multiplayer online games is I, as a character, as a player, I play a role in this overall story, in this plot line, and my, my efforts can matter. And I can dial up my efforts. I can just be the casual player that plays a few nights a week and does stuff. Or I could be I could be the guild leader or in our, in our world, a settlement leader, and I could really inspire a bunch of people, and I could, I could go do amazing things. So I love that. I really love that. I used to... Um, I used to give a, a couple of conference talks way back in the aughts uh, when I was running GoPets, and I was talking about what I call the 7-Eleven Gamer. Um, it's a thought experiment. You know, it's back when people, you know, were questioning games. Now, now games are pretty well accepted, you know. But, but back then, you know, oh, all you do is just play online games. Uh, you know, but you know, now now esports is a thing. It's all much more accepted. But it's still a little bit relevant, and then you kind of you're kind of back to again with like play to earn and some questions about that, some squishiness around that. But a thought experiment I have is, you know, a lot of folks have relatively regular jobs and relatively regular lives. You know, like I think about a guy or a woman um, working at a gas station at Barstow in California, like on the way to Vegas, and people cruise by, and then they buy, you know, uh, cigarettes or beer or whatever, and and some gas, and they go someplace, and ah, that person's working hard all day, and they're making money for their you know, family, whatever. That's great. But you know what they do when they go home? 
they go online and they're part of an amazing guild. They're part of an amazing faction and they're, you know, uh, slaying dragons or conquering territory or flying starships around or settling Mars, right? This kind of faction versus faction play, I think, is, is hugely important. A lot of fun. Very romantic. I'm waxing on too long. Carrie's, Carrie's reaching for a drink a little bit. <laughs> but, I haven't even gotten to the wine yet. Yeah. Um, but I'm a big fan of not one versus one faction. I don't like the two factions. Because the problem with two factions, like if you've played on World of Warcraft for any amount of time, you know, once Horde gets dominant on one server, they just keep dominating the, the battlegrounds. And everybody's like, oh, what's the point? You know? It just gets to be a runaway battle. So I don't like just two. Um, I'm currently favoring three major factions on Mars with uh, a flying fourth. And the flying fourth can go roll around and, and, and support some of the underdogs. So I like, I like self-balancing systems. Like if somebody gets way ahead, if faction A is way ahead, then everybody else gangs up on A and brings it back down to reality. And then B starts to rise and then a and C go chase them down. But then D, you never know what D's doing. D's like running around back and forth. So I really like that. I saw in some of the pre-questions, um, yeah, there is there is a little bit of nationalism. There's a little bit of, whoa, USA versus China in the, in the Beto timeline. But the Beto timeline is younger than our other later timeline. As you start to learn it, the story more, Carrie's playing with, she's playing with a whole bunch of storylines. Like it goes way back in time. But it also, there's two, there's a main timeline for our world in the 2060s, 2070s, but then 2030s, 2040s are also important. And we are going to touch a bit on, on nationalism. We're going to touch, touch about a little bit about that. But by like the 2060s, 2070s, our Martians are Martians. And those factions are, they challenge some of the older nation states. Um, I hesitate to say more words because I'm now encroaching on world design, which is Carrie's area. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that goes to, um, there were questions I wanted to explore, like I said, and I don't have, um, I would say I'm, that's one of the things I'm struggling with as I'm writing the book is making sure I land some of those ideas um, in in the right place or at least where I where I was aiming for and I can answer for them appropriately, right? Like I I, um, I wrote Beto, to be honest, I, um, if I get more specific about influences, um, it was interesting to me to see what a, a cultural touchstone um, Ayn Rand's book Atlas Shrugged became for the right in our country, uh, starting with kind of the Tea Party movement in the mid aughts. And um, like like a lot of people who, you know, go through college in the U.S., I had read that. And um, there were things about, you know, there are things that are easy to understand about, you know, the symbolism in that book that's attractive to people. But I thought it was it was interesting that nobody's really written a rebuttal to it for modern times. You know, she wrote this book, regardless of how you feel about her politics, and people have a range of views on that. But um her, her central idea was that a rugged individualist, a person who was enterprising enough and worked hard enough, um, could achieve success all on their own. And really anybody else who was trying to share in that success was in some way um, uh, a parasite on them, you know? And uh, that central idea just doesn't seem relevant to me anymore, even if it ever was, uh, because, you know, the world has become too complex. We've all become specialized in our fields. And if we're going to achieve big goals from here, and to be clear, you know, as we know, we've talked about this in a number of broadcasts before, um, we are, you know, as a company, believers in science and also believers that for humans to thrive from here, we need to expand into space. And if we're going to pull off becoming multiplanetary, no one person is going to do that alone, you know, on the backs of of uh of everyone else and nor are they going to be able to enjoy any kind of success that isn't interdependent on the health and welfare of everybody else as well so um i wrote beto as a character who is sort of a um sort of supposed to be directly a response to the worldview that she created um we'll, we'll see if he develops that way very cool very cool i appreciate the insight to that i, the, I think that builds on some of the uh the character development where you get some of your inspirations. I definitely want to rebuttal to that, uh, 
and run there. So next, I wanted to ask, how does the world of Million on Mars look now? So everybody knows who Leon Dusk is. Everybody knows that Dusk is the coin that is traded around as currency. But realistically, some players are wondering, well, what is the Dusk Works? Where are we? And how did we get here? <laughs> yes. Yeah, so you are, if you've noticed, there's the Dustworks Landing, uh, Dustworks Landing Trading Outpost, which is a, at a unique lat long on planet Mars. And it is a place as we're, we're working toward, Eric, you should talk about this, how we're working toward gameplay and your location meaning something and you, you being in a place. Yeah. Um, so we have... Duskwork Landing, and we have Ad Astra Unlimited, we've got Velma, we've got Leon Dusk, we've got these characters. Um, we are soon, sometime in August, releasing a new first-time user experience. Really excited about that. It's going to clean up a lot of things, fix a lot of bugs, frankly. And, uh, and one of the coolest things is you'll be able to just land and start playing without a crypto wallet, without having to register, you just start playing and you get right into it. So you'll be playing at Dustworks Landing. And then we're going to start building out some more missions. We're going to go towards a more classical MMORPG type thing where the player gets some player versus environments and questing. Uh, we'll be layering this out incrementally, August, September, October, and keep on going. Um, but yeah, so where you are in the world will matter. Um, it won't matter crazy hard. Don't worry. Don't worry where you bought your plots. Like, don't no reason to like flip the fucking table right now and just, you know, bring the torches, just relax. We'll be thoughtful, we'll be incremental about it, it will be cool. But things will start to matter and it'll start to feel better and it'll start to make more sense. Um, we've got a fantastic founder, quiet fellow, um, who's uh, an active practicing planetary scientist who's bringing us some really neat uh, game ingestible resource maps that are from, um, the gamma ray spectrometer that's orbiting Mars right now and helping massage that data and getting it ready to go. Um, and then we got to start putting down some of the other uh, playable cities uh, there. Um, we're great fans of Waterloo, Waterloo being the alternative name for Austin that never really quite uh, made it, but we're going to, we're going to bring it back. So new Austin on Mars will be Waterloo. So we have two, two planned towns at least right now, Duskworks Landing, uh, which is a little bit, it will be a little bit inspired like by Mos Eisley and, and Star Wars, but a little bit more rational. And then, uh, and then Waterloo will be a proper city. Yeah, Leon and Velma are supposed to be foils for each other. And Velma and Beto are foils for each other in my mind in that, you know, they're all contemporaneous. And Velma is a little bit of a throwback in that she's still very um, independent. You know, she thinks she can do a lot herself and she's sort of an embodiment of that ideal. And um, she's gonna lean into that really hard in her storyline. Um, she's my favorite. She's, you know, scenery chewing. Um, obviously a lot of her background is informed um, by being, you know, a, a woman in tech and um, having the kind of interests she does, which are kind of quirky and unusual. But um, but she's, I. I think of her as a very complicated character, um, very um, lots of lots of facets. Um, I think of all of them that way. Fantastic. Let's see here. Ooh, this one's decent. Let's see here. So we know some of the characters in the book are on Earth and that's where the story starts. Is there a plan for Earth to be brought into the game? Are players going to go to Earth? Or are they going to go somewhere else first? Or do we have no plans to leave the, the, the planet Mars until we get some of this, the rest of this built out yet? Well, to start with, so on the world side, I will say that um, I, I wanted, it was important to me to start book one. Again, my, my main goal here is my main goal is entertainment. You know, I would like everybody at the end of this to have a, you know, a paperback that it's fun to take to the beach that you want to give to your friends um, that isn't so heavy. That's uh, that that you know brings you a little joy and inspiration, um, and leaves you feeling good about the future and some things that might be interesting to you to go learn more about, go work on, go you know, ask your kids if they're interested. 
Um, and, uh, you know, I think that it was important to me to show the difference between the opportunities, like both show that um, with good decisions and with, with a little bit more um, collectivists and a focus on the common good, you know, we can start achieving things on earth. Earth doesn't have to be a hellscape, but there can still be even better opportunities um, out in the solar system. If you're, if you're willing to take a risk and go explore and go move to Mars and go expand. And as Eric said, we keep exploring this world and we do have ideas. We've been inspired, you know, obviously been inspired so far. The, the, the main ideas in the book, the central technologies and so on are, uh, with the exception of Metis and Meta Shield, which is just this little bit of magic, um, that we invented, you know, for story purposes, the rest of it is all other people's ideas that we're building on. Um, the idea of the Buffalo Commons as a national park in and of itself was proposed, you know, in the 90s by some sociologists. Um, the artificial magnetosphere on Mars is proposed by NASA. Um, all of these things, and, and we're, we're interested in other ideas too, like um, Gerard O'Neill's, um, what was it called, Eric, the High Plains? His idea, the central idea, that inspired Jeff Bezos and Blue Origin that maybe at some point um, all humans will will expand to space stations and Mars and other planets and live in space and maybe Earth will become more of a national park for you know the rest of the biome. Um, I don't we don't know where that's going yet, but um, these are some ideas we've been playing with. That's a Delta V map of the solar system. That tells you the uh, the energy cost to get around the solar system. And uh, I like the Delta V map. I put it up on my wall. So, yeah, we will expand. We use we use Mars. I'm going to throw out your uh, meta, metaglyph theory term, and then maybe you can unpack that, Gary. But we use Mars as, a, like, the lighthouse to inspire people. Um, but there are so many resources out in space. Um, if you think about the asteroids and you think about their mineable depth, because you can you can mine the asteroids um, much easier than you can mine the, the core of Earth, right? Uh, on Earth, you can only mine about 10 miles deep, and we're, we have a 6,000 mile radius, so 99.999% of Earth, you can't you can't get to it, right? So there's actually there's actually more resources out in the asteroids. Than on Earth, three to ten thousand times more. And then you've got the sun. The sun just shines all the time. Like you can put solar panels out there, you can collect all that. You know, there's ring rules with all kinds of Dyson spheres, all kinds of crazy ideas. There is so much wealth in the solar system. Everybody could be a hundred billionaire. Everybody could be a billionaire in today's measurement system if we just got out there. So we can have this fantastic, beautiful future. Um, so yeah, we got to mess around. We got to go see the whole solar system. We got to have plots of land on on Ceres. We got to have, you know, uh, you know, Phobos Station. We've got to have players build like a gateway and and, and geosynchronous orbit and that at all too. Like there's a lot of places we got to go. A lot of stuff to build and a lot of fun systems to put back and forth. Um, we've got a hugely bright future. A lot of fun things to put together. Yeah. Um, I saw in the chat as it scrolled by, somebody asked me what my favorite character is. It has to be Velma. I like Velma mm -hmm. a lot. She's willing to take some big chances and just build stuff and let's let's see what happens. Um, <laughs> yes. I uh, whenever I play Dungeons and Dragons, I play a chaotic good, chaotic <laughs> character. I like I like chaos. I like going forward. I have a dim view on lawful neutral characters. <laughs> Playing it by the book, it's not Eric's yeah. feed. Yeah. yeah. Constitutionally incapable. Yeah. Another question uh, I saw in the chat, Carrie, is are you up for somebody doing an audiobook? Mm -hmm. Yes. In fact, um, we've tried to trick Allie into it a couple times. Uh, but so far, I don't know, she's claiming to be really busy on doing, you know, UI and art and video stuff and sound stuff. So. Um, but yeah, I think that would, I, I would love to do that. Maybe we'll do that when we do the editing pass for the full book. Speaking of a full book, are we planning on doing a hard copy book signing perhaps? 
Yes. Oh my God, that would be a dream come true for me. Absolutely. We are, the whole plan is to, um, at the end of this, uh, the, all 24 chapters will go through an editing pass and maybe some reordering and stuff. Um, and then we will publish it as a paperback and an ebook, um, and possibly a hardcover. Um, aiming for that in the next six months or so. And like I said, we really feel like we've, we do feel like we're on to something and I, and I love all the feedback. Please keep it coming in the, in the book lore channel, you know, on the, on the story itself, but also on, you know, how we're rolling it out. Um, we feel like we're on to something, building a world that's immersive enough that you want to play in it and read about it and can build on it. And um, that's really exciting to me. It's, a, it's, it's fun to get to work on that. I, I really enjoy working, especially on that part of this. Okay, Eric, thank you so much. Do you have anything else you'd like to add to wrap this AMA up? Anything you'd like to share with the audience before we go? Uh, yeah, I got one last thing. Uh, we'll be pushing the Team Cebu Love Super Leaderboard shortly. I also call it Celebrities Love and Dusk. <laughs> nice. It, it's a huge leaderboard. It's going to last for 14 days. We've got the Jesse, the Victor, in there as a top of the grand prize pool. Uh, these guys are, they've got the celebrity bankroll, so they're like rolling in like a roughly equivalent of $5,000 of cash if we were to value such things in, in their tokens. Uh, they also have the mythic constitution, and you know you like constitution. Constitution is the stat to go chase. Um, and they're artisans in their two professions. Jesse is the artisan miner. And if you're trying to get mining XP right now, you might appreciate that because we're pretty stingy on the mining XP. So I, I would try to snap up that, Jesse, if that was possible. And Victor is holding out for the cooking system that, uh, that Mitch is noodling on, as they say. Those are the two grand prizes. But I've also seeded it with a million dusk worth of other prizes. It's big and thirsty. So there's like two million dusk worth of prizes in this leaderboard. And it's going to work really cool. It's kind of complicated. But... You go and you buy Team Cebu raffle tickets for Dusk, for Vibes, or mining tokens. Then you take them over to the little mission sh sheet. You turn them in. You can turn in one new ticket. You get one used ticket. You can turn in 10 new tickets. You get 11 used tickets. You can turn in 100 new tickets. You get 120 used tickets. Then you go, and then you go enter this big-ass leaderboard this 2 million dusk prize leaderboard that lasts for 14 days. So you enter the thing and it costs a hundred dust to enter. You pay that once. That's it. You enter, pop in a raffle ticket. It's 10 dusk. Boom. You got a chance to win a freaking celebrity Mars. And it's worth five, 500,000 dusk right there. Now, if you'd like to enter more, you buy more raffle tickets. Like I said, and the more you buy, the better they can turn in, but you turn in these new tickets and you get back these used tickets. So what are used tickets? Well, we're trying to think about it, you know. Um, we had some leftover candy canes. Leftover candy canes <laughs> laying around your inventory. That's kind of Carrie's favorite sand in her shoes. Who really <laughs> ate the leftover candy canes. Yeah. <laughs> so you got these leftover used raffle tickets. So you know what we're going to do? Run more leaderboards. So you, you enter the main thing, you score in the main thing, but then you got new used tickets, and then you can use the used tickets as entry fees to these side leaderboards. And we're gonna be running those. We're gonna do them like on an hourly cadence, eight hour cadence, 16 hour cadence, 24 hour cadence, all sorts of little fun things. We're gonna have a lot of fun and experiments with that. And we're gonna be syncing these used tickets. They go away, so you're not looking, you're not like wondering why do I have these things in my inventory? They go away, they get cleaned up, you get scores, you win the side ones, stuff to talk about. Maybe you wake up until like three or four o'clock in the morning. Maybe when the DA is a little lower, you sneak in, you grab one of these side ones, you win. Whatever, there should be lots of little meta, a lot of little little strategies to play. But here's the deal. We've got five wonderful wonderful people working for us out in Cebu, Philippines. We've got Kevin. Kevin's our overall project manager, director of engineering. He runs a team over there. We've got Now and Jude. And even internally, that's how we say it, Now and Jude. Jude and Now, Now and Jude. We say that. They're both freaking monsters. Great, great software engineers. They can just do anything real fast. Um, and they are somehow like fungible, excellent engineers, but we'll go back and forth. We also have Angelo and James. They do all the UI front end work. 
So all the settlements feature you guys have played with, all the Marzins you have to play with, the near turn roadmap, that's all Team Cebu. They do that. They roll out all these new features. We want to give these guys a bonus. So they're all going to get a $1,000 bonus as a minimum. That's how we're getting started. And then depending on how much dusk and how many raffle tickets we sink, we're going to increase that bonus and make it more fun. So we got 14 days to celebrate Team Cebu. Oh, and why are we giving away these two like Silberry Marzins? We held back 500 of these Marzins from that first 6,000 print. We opened up the 500 and we're like, oh my gosh, we got two of the 18. That's awkward. You know? <laughs> That's bad. That's bad. However, we give them away, people are going to be like, That's suspicious. Oh, they're giving it to their friends. Oh, huh? So, oh, okay. Like, okay. So we're going to have to, we're going to have to drink some coffee and give these away like really well and very carefully. So we have this big grand leaderboard when it gets all done. Oh, here's the other cool thing. You got the leaderboard tech built by lamp. It's fantastic. It's great. When it gets done, you get to see it. Everything gets finalized at the same time. We'll do another live streaming a thing. And then when we do the live streaming thing, You'll see the two Marzins given away live, live on video, nothing behind the curtains. We're not giving it to any friends. Uh, somebody did ask if some whale buys a huge, humongous amount of tick, raffle tickets and they win the first one and they roll a second time, do they get the second one? No. If, <laughs> if they're lucky two times in a row, we're going to re roll until it's somebody else. So two different people are going to get these things and we are going to sink. We're going to sink these vines, we're going to sink the minting tokens, and we're going to sink the dusk. Dusk is going to go up. Dusk is never going to be this low ever again, or I'm going to go eat a new cup of dirt. That implies you've eaten an old cup of dirt. I have had to do this in the past. Yeah, please. No, no, no. You're not eating anything strange. We need you. We, we got to get PVP rover battles out. We got all kinds of stuff that we need here. Yeah. So please don't make him eat anything strange. Right. So we were very, very close to, we were very, very close to launching this. Um, in fact, uh, Babouche, as you guys know him on Discord, had it all ready to go, and he was about to send it about 10 minutes right before this AMA happened. I was like, oh, hold it. Let's get the AMA done so we don't ask the user base to concentrate on two different streams at once. So we've held back that big leaderboard so we can tell you about the wonderful world of, of Moon on Mars. Now we're wrapping up the AMA. We can get on with that release, and we can celebrate the team and, and Cebu and have a whole bunch of side prizes and fun. I can hear them saying, get off the screen. We want that leaderboard now. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. You did an amazing job pulling this together and hosting this. Thank you so much for doing this. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you, Eric, for being here. Thank you, Jump K. Oh, and if you're waiting for your founders drop, Joel's about to get that airdrop going. <laughs> no rest. Oh, yeah. All right. Have a great day, everyone. All right. Bye.